So continuing on what is best for baby, I'm going to give you a story to illustrate. So a lady contacted me, oh, it must have been about three years ago now, and she said, Barbara, my, my baby was born very preemie. So note the history. This baby was born, <coughs> oh, nearly two months preemie. So that baby is going to be a little bit smaller. That baby, its first year of development is going to be a little bit slower. I said, what's the problem? She said, my baby's stomach is always swollen. He's very thin. He's got thin legs. How old is he? Ten months old. How many teeth does he have? Three. What's he eating? Oh, I'm really trying to fatten him up. So I, he is breastfed, but I'm giving him cereal. I'm giving him bread. I'm giving him legumes. Can you see what's happening here? That poor stomach just could not handle it and could not break it down. So I, I told her about the teeth. I told her about how there's no Tylen, P-T-Y-L-I-N, it's a salivary amylase. And as Julia mentioned, there are very small amounts which are necessary just for the breakdown of the breast milk, but not enough <laughs> to cope with a slice of bread, not enough to cope with, these, with food. And it made sense to her. And she said, well, he's used to eating. And this is something also to assess. If the baby's used to eating, you can't just stop the food. Otherwise, you're going to have terrible trouble every mealtime. Mm -hmm. So I said, just because the baby's used to food, I said, just give the baby fruits. Um, just give the baby uh, maybe some steamed broccoli, maybe a bit of steamed cauliflower and sweet potato. Sweet potato, when it's well cooked, comes down to a very simple sugar. She emailed me back a month later. She said, thank you so much. She said, the stomach has gone right down. And I find this in several cases with babies, children and adults. They feel they've got to feed them up, but you've got to fix the gut first. <laughs> because if it can't get out of the gut into the tissues, it, you know, it's, it's really not working. So she was very happy, Mum. She, she emailed me again at 14 months. So this happened at 10 months. So at 14 months, she said, Barbara, my son stopped eating. He was starting to crawl. That's very late. But remember, this is a preemie baby. So they are going to be a bit later. He stopped, he stopped crawling. Uh, I, I think his brain's going to stop developing. I think his muscles are going to stop developing. And I'm, I'm thinking, where's this coming from? So I said to her, is the baby teething? She said, yes. And it's the molars that are coming through. He's got his eight teeth here now. And I said, ah, oh, no wonder. I said, when babies are teething, they want to be held more. They're not eating very much. You know, that's, that's quite, they're, they're not themselves when they're teething. People say to me, what did you do when they were teething? I said, uh, got the sling. You know, the sling, put the baby in the sling, just wrap them to me. They're, they're, they're happy then. And some people say, but I can't, I can't do that all their life. I said, no, it's just while they're teething, just while they're teething. Do you know, it's a better drug than any baby Panadol you can give them. And I never gave any of my babies anything like that. I just held them all for a few days. Yes, it's a little bit harder, but it's just for a few days. And then... Her father contacted me. I'm a professor at Loma Linda University. I'm very concerned about my grandson. We believe that his brain is going to stop developing because he's not eating food. My wife's a physiotherapist and she thinks his, his muscles aren't going to develop. Aha, uh -huh, now we know where this is coming from. Mm -hmm. So I wrote back to him and I said to him, did you know that it's only the last hundred years babies are being fed food? Do you know what that means? Galileo, uh, Mozart, Einstein, the, the brilliant geniuses from times past were not fed food as babies. Hmm. And I said, did you know that there's no enzyme in the mouth to break down the starch? They were wanting her to take the baby to hospital and get blood tests to see what the nutritional levels are. Eh, can you imagine how traumatic that is? The blessing was the baby was breastfed. 
<laughs> and when babies are breastfed and they're sick or upset, they usually want to feed a little bit more and that's, that's really not a problem when they're sick. And so, and he'd actually said to me, I'm writing to you because my daughter listens to you, but I'm appealing to you, you know, the development of this child. So I quoted to him basically the things I just told him. And as a scientist, he would have surely acknowledged all that. I didn't hear anything else. And then six weeks later, the mother contacted me and she said, his, his teeth are through. He's eating <laughs> and I can give him a little bit of bread now because the molars are through and uh, he's crawling again. Thank you so much. And then I get an email from her father. <clears throat> Thank you so much. <laughs> can I give you something? I said, oh, if you want to, here are my details. $400 I got. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I knew why, you know, and, and that's, and you see what you're dealing with, emotions, mm -hmm. emotions. So it's good to know a little bit of your history, yeah? So how do you start and use the food after 16 months? How do you start the food when you do start the food? Most children, my son James was the exception, most children have already had the little tastes. So you give them a cucumber to suck on, you give them a piece of apple to suck on. But won't they choke? There's a big difference between gagging and choking. Okay? Gagging is when they go, oh, and then it pops out. And that's an absolutely natural reflex, and it happened nearly every time my little ones ate. Choking's different. Choking's when it gets stuck. Choking more happens in a child that has not learned to chew. And that's why it's important not to give them slop or mash. I never made baby food, ever. My baby's first foods were bits that they could pick up and chew on. So that's very important. So don't get all upset when they gag. You know, it's a gagging reflex. It just, <laughs> it just comes right out. But many people don't give their children pieces of apple, pieces of cucumber, pieces of uh, celery because they think they're going to choke. So it's important to, to, there's a difference between the gagging and the choking. Gagging, it, it always just comes back out, yeah? But uh, that's, you want, if they're starting on foods, then you need to have the satisfying foods, eventually, like sweet potato, you wouldn't start with that also? No, I wouldn't because their main meal is breast. Their, their main food is breast. And so you always give them, when you start introducing, you give them something. And I only ever gave my children something at mealtime. That's the end time they want it because they see what you're doing. And I'd put them in the high chair and I'd give them pieces. And then my daughter, Julia, she was just wanting. You know, she's my fourth child. But I still would not give her any starch yet. So I'd steam little bits of broccoli. But what I do is here's our meal and I just look in my meal at what they could have. Mm -hmm. So I'd give them a, the stem of the uh, lettuce, the hard stem or the stem of the uh, cabbage leaf, you know, where they can hold and suck on it. And if there really wasn't much that I could give them, it's like the meal we had yesterday. It was uh, gluten-free noodles and a tomato sauce and... There's not much there. So I would cook a corn cob. I would cut all the corn off the cob and give them the cob. Oh, they suck on that for a long time. And they, they're sucking the juice out. And one lady said to me, it's fantastic. Everywhere I go, I've got, a, I've got a corn cob with all the, you know, I've cooked it and cut all the bits off. And oh, they're happy for a long, long time. So you start with little tiny bits and that really gets their gut used to that. Yes? So that, with that you start before 16 months? Before 16 months, yeah, yeah. So if you're starting at 16 months, basically um, at 16 months my son James had eight teeth, so he didn't have his molars. So I would just do the same thing, starting with a bit of cucumber, starting with a bit of celery. And my son James was well padded. So he really didn't need much. What if they're not well padded? What if they're quite slender? 
Well, that's perfectly all right too, because you get slender babies and you get more padded babies. The only time it's a worry is if they're really, really skinny. You know, it's like my, my grandson, he was getting wrinkles in here. My son said, mom, dear babies cry a lot. I said, no, they don't. My babies didn't cry a lot. There's something wrong if babies are crying a lot. And then I discovered the baby was fighting the breast. Now the baby's seven months of age. And then I discovered that the mother had a gluten and a dairy intolerance. So it was coming through to the baby. And how do I know that? Because she used to get hay fever all the time. And so I said to her, I wouldn't be surprised if your baby also has the intolerance. So one night my son said he just could not bear the crying any longer. So he went and bought a, a lactose free milk. And when he brought it home, the baby just drank as if the baby was starving. And the baby basically was starving because the baby was hungry, but the baby knew, you know, would fight the breast. It would... And so I said, well, give the baby goat's milk. Goat's milk is, is the closest of animal milk to the human milk. And so they, I, I know in Australia you can just buy baby formulas, you can buy goat's milk baby formula. Oh, they had a happy baby. <laughs> the baby didn't cry all the time, the baby started to put on weight. So, you see, you're looking at response. You're looking at response. Not all babies will have that intolerance, but I have found that when a baby has eczema or asthma or is troubled, it could be that it's allergic to what the mother's eating. Remember your five allergens? You stop the peanuts, stop the dairy, stop the wheat, stop the oats and the refined sugar. Now it can take two months before those, those foods are out of the body. After that? Pardon? After that, after what, introducing food? Yeah, we're talking now about fruits and cucumbers. Yeah, fruits and cucumbers, steamed broccoli, steamed cauliflower, little bits of um, uh, sweet potato. I think it's nice if they feed themselves. It'll be a little bit messy, but at first they can just feed with their fingers. Do you know the beauty of them eating with their fingers is they can feel the temperature of the food. Mm. So, that, so that certainly helps. Avocado is great, so you can give them little squares of avocado. So I always let them feed themselves. Takes them longer to eat and then gives you time to eat your meal. There's a question. When do you introduce the greens? When the molars are through. When the molars are fully through. Months, they are through, aren't they? Some babies they're through at 16 months, some babies they're not through till 22 months. So you keep on those until the molars are through. And then they can start to have some legumes. Then they can start to have some, some breads. But I think it ideally uh, not the wheats. And when you do give them the grains, there should be long, slow cooking. That's where your slow cook is great. One lady said she just does the millet on overnight. With millet, it needs about three, sometimes three and a half cups of water to one cup of millet. And I always only fed the children, the baby, I didn't really feed babies, but at mealtime, only at mealtime. So I remember one day my son Peter, Peter was very, very fussy and Peter would cry when he was about three if, because they'd have porridge and sometimes it'd be oats, sometimes it'd be millet, sometimes it'd be rice, sometimes it'd be quinoa, but he'd cry if a slice of banana fell into the honey and he liked his honey right in the middle of his porridge. And if any of the children cried, they had to leave the room. And I think that's very, very important because if you only feed the children a couple of times a day, where do they want to be? At the table. But they could not stay at the table if they cried or make a fuss. So he had to go out. And then I'd go to the door after five minutes and say, are you going to be a good boy now? No! And then you just shut the door and come back and eat your meal. Because you can't digest if you've got issues like this at the table. So I'd go to the door and say, are you going to be a good boy now? And so he'd come in and we'd try again. I remember one day everything went wrong in that porridge. 
I think the spoon touched something that it shouldn't touch. Anyway, so we didn't get much to eat that day. By the end of the meal, and I, I did discover that if I'd say to him in the first five minutes, if you don't cry, you can have carob powder on your porridge. Oh, he tried very, very hard then mm. not to cry. Do you know my son Peter now is 33 and he's a tiler and he's a perfectionist. So mothers, when you see these traits coming through, it's, <laughs> it's almost personality traits. And so what would happen is he hadn't eaten very much. And so by 10 o'clock, um, I'm hungry. Okay, have a glass of water. Have a little bit of salt and a glass of water. That, that keeps them happy for about an hour. So now we're at maybe 11.30. I'm hungry. Well, if you sit very still, you can have half a glass of soy milk or almond milk, or if you happen to have a carrot, celery and apple juice, that. And, and you make out it's a great honour. If you sit very still, you can have this. So he drinks that. And that keeps little ones happy for a while. So we're one o'clock now and he's hungry. And lunch is in, I don't know, half an hour, three quarters of an hour. All right, if you sit very still, you can have this carrot. Now, how long does it take a three-year-old to eat a carrot? Long time. <laughs> if I give him a sandwich, he's not going to eat his lunch. Can you see that? And so the next day, and I don't say to him, now, if you'd eaten your breakfast, if you hadn't cried all through the breakfast, you would have eaten it. No, 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 they're not stupid. They know. And you lose them when you say the obvious. They're very smart. And the next day, we didn't have near as much fuss at the table because he remembered what happened the day before. <laughs> So I'd always keep to mealtimes. And between mealtimes, um, they'd, the, they'd have water. Any more questions on children? Yes? Is breastfeeding in regard to the times? Breastfeeding in regard to times. I used to always breastfeed my babies about every three hours. Breast milk um, digest very quickly. My sister found that her baby could go four hours. I found that my babies couldn't quite cope with four hourly, <laughs> so I went to three hourly. So I, three hourly feeding. Except if they were distressed or a bit upset or had a fever, I might feed them a little bit more. Yes? Until they were 16 months, you were feeding them all three hours? Yes. Wow. Yes, yes. And my daughter, just imagine this, twins. <laughs> she used to, in the car she had this bottle of water, was about four litres with a pipe coming out of it. And while she's driving, she'd drink water. <laughs> she drank a lot of water. I used to feed my babies till they were about two and a half. And so you see more and more food and less and less, less and less breasts. I think James was about two and a half, yes? We have a question concerning the mother. What does a mother eat when she's breastfeeding? What a mother should eat when she's breastfeeding is a very balanced diet, which is high fiber, generous amounts of protein and healthy fats. So basically just a balanced diet. Um, some women might need a little something at night. And if it's at night, maybe a smoothie, maybe a soup. Maybe some crackers and avocado. Crackers are like swieback and they digest quite quickly. That's not a bigger focus on uh, carbs? Not really, no. no. So you could breastfeed even if you eat non-carbs? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You could. And remember, on a vegetarian diet, it's impossible to have no carbs because everything has some carbs. The only way you can have no carbs is to have a meat and dairy diet and vegetables but no potatoes. <laughs> that's, that's really, I think that's about, I think Dr. Atkins' first stage of his diet was something like 20 milligrams of carbs a day. <laughs> but I say to, and, but his diet had different stages, I think about four stages. But I say to people, you don't have to go down to 20 carbs a day and it's really impossible on a vegetarian diet, just as long as they're, as they're reduced. So let's continue looking at our, our acid alkaline foods. 
So lima beans and lentils and soy are your three alkaline legumes. And remember, soy is only a problem if it's been genetically modified or grown with poisons. There are two alkaline nuts. One is almond and the other is Brazil. Almonds are called the king of nuts because they are high in iron, they are high in protein and they are an alkaline nut. Brazil is phenomenally high in selenium. Selenium is an important mineral because your thyroid needs selenium to convert iodine into thyroxine. And mercury fillings have an have a affinity for um, selenium. So when someone's got a mouthful of mercury fillings, it's going to take all their selenium. So if someone has thyroid problems, it's important to investigate whether they have thyroid, uh, whether they have mercury fillings, yeah? There are a lot of different um, amounts out there in the web where they say how many Brazil nuts we should take. There are between two and three and five. Yeah, well, let, well, well let's, just, let's just grab the five. <laughs> Five Brazil nuts a day, that's a nice amount. They're the two alkaline nuts. They're the two nuts I usually eat every day for breakfast. Lunchtime, I might have macadamia or I might have cashew. It's a nice dessert, is a small handful of nuts. Nuts are expensive, they're very concentrated, you don't need much. Most people don't have nuts for a month and then they eat a whole bag. Isn't that true? <clears throat> all, your, all your seeds sit on the alkaline side. So the most acid forming substance that can be taken into the human body really is the pure crystallized acid that's extracted from the sugarcane plant. These acid forming foods are high in the, in the acid minerals, which is phosphorus, chlorine, and sulfur. So meat, meat is not far behind. When meat breaks down in the body, only 58% is burnt as fuel. So that leaves a 42% waste. It's a sulfur waste, it's highly acidic. And so what the body does is it uses the calcium to negate the sulfur residue, meaning being the most alkaline minerals. So look at the glass of milk. A glass of milk is high in animal protein. It is high in calcium. And the five stomachs of the cow can handle that, but remember we've only got one. So because of the high acid waste that the animal protein gives off, that uses all the calcium to negate that acid waste, how much calcium is left for the human body? None. And that explains why the countries in this world that are the highest dairy consumers have the highest incidence of osteoporosis. So looking at the most acid forming foods, that's the most alkaline down to the least alkaline. This is the most acid. Uh, aged cheese, what's the blue in the blue vein cheese? 
It is mold, that's right, so that's very acidic. But there is a pH 7 cheese and that would be something like your feta. So your fresh cheeses, cottage. But of course the problem with these is the cows they come from, ricotta. But they don't have the mould factor. So if you've got guests that want to eat cheese and are going to eat cheese or they've got a family, say, well, go, go for your fresh. But ideally, go for maybe organic cow or you can get goat or cow, no, goat or sheep. Um, I don't have much. They're not attractive to me, but these are options that you can give guests. Caffeine. All your caffeine foods and drinks are acid-forming. Alcohol is not a food, but it certainly creates an acid environment, as does tobacco. As do drugs. Remember, drugs are chemicals and have an acid effect. The acid, so all your other grains, other than millet, buckwheat, quinoa, amaranth, spelt and kamut. All your other legumes, other than lima, lentil and soy. All your other nuts, other than almond and Brazil, have an acid effect. But it's all about balance. So to maintain this 6.5 environment, We need to be taking into our bodies about 70 to 80 percent alkaline. So that's a 20 to 30 percent acid. So that 20 to 30 percent acid ideally should come from this section here. So it's not that rice is bad or oats are bad or chickpeas are bad or macadamia nuts are bad. No, no, no. You need a little acid. It's all about the balance. Mm -hmm. But what we find in Australia, about 90% of Australians are having an acid diet and 10% alcohol. No wonder disease is out of control. The hybridization of the wheat brought wheat over here too. It not only changed the starch structure, it also changed the gluten and the protein structure and it also changed the, the mineral balance structure. So when we take our minds back to the carbohydrate list that I drew the other day, how many of those are from the acid side? They're all from the acid side, <laughs> except for potatoes. And remember, the body runs according to precision balance, so it's maintaining the balance. So the easiest way to alkalize the diet is to start exploring other grains, is to eat more vegetables, more dark green leafy, and if the person doesn't have a diabetic problem, and if they don't have a weight problem, and if they don't have a yeast problem, and if they don't you know, have cancer, then they can eat more fruit. It's not the fruit's bad, it's only it depends on the, what's happening in the body. So again, it's all about balance. And a breaking of these laws creates the acid condition. So keeping of these laws, maintaining a more alkaline diet, gives the body the conditions that it can function very, very well and prevent disease. And if there is disease there, it can go far to beginning to turn it around. 
I'm surprised at how many people adhere to this when they leave our retreat. And I think it's because they've heard the whys, why we should be eating this way. But what I'd like to do now is I'd like to show you what, what the hybridization of the wheat did to the starch structure. And this knowledge is very, very important for your diabetics. This must be the dropsy day. <laughs> Yep, sure is. That's it's going to stay there. <laughs> the pen's got jumping beans in it. So not only did the hybridization of the wheat change the gluten or the protein structure, it changed the starch structure. And the starch structure that was created is called amylopectin A. Now, amylopectin A gets the blood sugar level up very high, very fast, and then you've got a corresponding drop. So let me give you something to compare it to. Amylopectin B is found in bananas and potatoes. And if you are familiar with the glycemic index of food, and the glycemic index of food is how quickly the sugar in that food gets the blood sugar level up high. So that, that's your bananas and your potatoes. Amylopectin C is found in legumes. So it's another amylopectin there. Legumes. So this is B gets it up relatively high, relatively fast, but not as high and not as fast. So not as low. So there, there's your A and there's your B. Well, what about the legumes? Legumes gives a lovely, steady, consistent rise, nice, steady, consistent drop. What does every cell in our body want? That nice, steady, consistent. There's your legumes. So excellent food for people with diabetes. Excellent food for people who have a yeast problem. Excellent people for, food for people who are conquering diabetes. Excellent food for people who are conquering cancer is the legumes. But a lot of people have been turned off legumes because they've been told they've got lectins. <laughs> Or well, they might say, but they cause me wind. It's usually if they're not cooked soft enough, if they're not rinsed enough, not pressure cooked. Cooked's not a word, is it? Cooked. <laughs> so when I married Michael, he could handle red lentils, lima beans, and kidney beans. Could not handle brown lentils, could not handle chickpeas. Mm -hmm. So what I did was if I cooked them, I just give him a teaspoon, just a teaspoon, and then he wouldn't react. And a few days later, two teaspoons. Mm -hmm. And now he can eat everything. Yes? What is better, a slow cooker or a pressure cooker? The pressure cooker is the best, but the slow cooker is pretty good, as long as you do the rinsing. Mm -hmm. And ideally you rinse three quarters of the way through the cooking because otherwise the legumes are starting to break down and you lose them. So what I like to do in the last section of cooking, maybe the last half hour, is I make a sauce and I put the rinsed legumes in the sauce and then that last cook is with the sauce and, and then you get the flavour going into them. Yeah? But why do you advocate for the pressure cooker uh, like in this 
setting, is it, isn't it just a, that it saves time? Is that not the reason? It kills lectins. Mm. Because? Mm -hmm. That's what Dr. Stephen Gundry said. He said, if you pressure cook the legumes, so they've obviously tested them, and once they're pressure cooked, they, uh, there's no leg lectins, yeah? Can you please repeat why? How do you cook them? So you cook them in a pressure cooker? Or? Well, <coughs> I don't have a pressure cooker at home, okay. but in our health centre we pressure cook everything. So what I do is I, and I've always had the fuel stove, the wood stove, so I rinse them, I've soaked them, rinse them, put them back on the stove. Halfway through cooking, I rinse them again. <laughs> as long as you get that dirty water away. So let's have a look at glycemic index. In relation to amylopectin, the amylopectin A. So your glycemic index is how quickly the glucose is released from the food and into the blood. So your glycemic index averages at 55. So anything under is considered low GI. Anything above is considered high GI. So let's have a look at uh, cherries. Cherries sit at 26. Grapefruit. Grapefruit sits at uh, 25. Those lovely little blueberries we had this morning straight from the forest, they're sitting about the same as cherries. So these are good fruits for the diabetic. They're good fruits for the person that's conquering yeast. They're good fruits as the cancer person goes into you know, the second stage of, of, of their diet. So looking at what's high, so let's have a look at uh, sugar. Sugar sits, I think it's about 59. Uh, whole meal, no, let me get this right in my head. White, so your white, white wheat, white wheat. So when I say white wheat, I'm talking about white bread, white pasta. It sits at 69. So it's higher than sugar. It's because of the amylopectin A. What about wholemeal? 72. How could that be? How could the whole meal get the blood sugar level up higher than the white? Because it's not refined, it's got more amylopectin A in it. And it's the amylopectin A that causes that blood glucose high. And I had a lady do our program and she, she started to cry. It was in the lecture. I said, why are you crying? She said, I'm a diabetic. She said, I was diagnosed two years ago. She said, I do everything they tell me. I have wholemeal bread, wholemeal pasta, wholemeal everything. And she said, and every six months I go back to the doctor and he puts me on more insulin. She said, the lady down the road, she has lollies and cakes and biscuits and donuts. I don't do that, she said. She said, you've just solved the puzzle. What's the definition of insanity? To do what you've always done and expect different results. She said, why don't nutritionists know what you're telling us? Well, in Australia, they grow a lot of wheat. So they're not going to speak against wheat because they grow so much. And unfortunately, vested interest has their finger everywhere. Now, if you want to explore this a little bit more, there's a book called Wheat Belly. It's a bestseller by Dr. William Davis. And he gives the whole story of what they've done to the wheat. 
podcast. Yes, yes. Well, it appears that brown sugar and raw sugar are coloured white sugar. And it is true that the brown sugar will have a little more minerals in it. But myself, I prefer to keep away. Yes? And the other, the other grains, um, like, okay, you've got the ancient grains, but then you've got the other common grains, like rye and barley, yes. when they are whole. Yes, they have, yeah, not, they have not been played with. They have not gone through the intensive crossbreeding. But the amylopectin A, is that present? The amylopectin A was created in the hybridisation process. So it, it is something that's not usually there. Yeah? Where would the original species of uh, grain, like uh, Kamut and Einkorn, where would they be on the scale? They don't have the amylopectin A in them. No. So they're, they're sitting more down at, they're probably halfway between amylopectin C and C and B. Oh, you, well, I, I haven't memorised everything on the glycemic index. You'd have to, to look at that. But the, the bananas are very high, but cherries are very low. So it's good to know the glycemic index with your diabetic people and show them that they can, instead of having bananas on their breakfast, they can have blueberries or cherries on their breakfast. And instead of having the white potato, they can have the sweet potato because the sweet potato is quite low. Yeah? So also for people with yeast infection, yeah. they can eat low glycemic index yes. food and also That's fruits. Right. That's right. Low, low glycemic fruits. That's right. Yes? So which kind of sweet can you can you use then? Agave? So it depends what sweet. Well, we use uh, honey, we use maple syrup, we use uh, palm sugar because palm sugar is the or coconut sugar, it's the crystallised nectar from the palm flower. And in Australia, and I know also in America, where, where you buy sugars, you can get a packet of palm or coconut sugar and it's, um, it's a brown colour. Yeah, uh, 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 the sugar is not, uh, not good at all. So yeah, there's... there's uh, there's opinions on agave sugar. Yeah, I I personally have never used it. Isn't it just a general principle of what is refined and what is not? I mean, the more refined, the worse it is. It's just like the right. cayenne. No, sorry, the 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 sugar, the white sugar is refined from the plant, and if you yes. have whole plants, like yeah. Yes. Is there a nutritional book containing all these information? Uh, you can Google glycemic index yes. and the, I've referred to Nutrition Almanac a few times. That, um, that is revived. I think they do a revived Nutrition Almanac about every, I don't know, eight, ten years. But a friend of mine... Uh, lent me his nutrition almanac from 1976, <laughs> but there's really not much difference. Yeah. So in this case, date syrup, what we here can buy? Yeah, yeah, date syrup's quite. Date syrup's uh, another one. You can make your own date syrup, you know, by cooking your dates in in water. That's incredibly sweet, so not great for the diabetic or the person with yeast or the person with cancer. Mm -hmm. So it, de it depends on, uh, that's why you look at the history and symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yes? What's about raisins and figs? Uh, your dates, raisins and figs are very high in the glycemic index. And of course for the average person that doesn't have a disease or sickness, they're, they're fine. But we don't use dates or figs or raisins. Or s See, your raisins we call sultanas. Mm -hmm. And our raisins are a, a bigger, from a, I guess, a bigger grape. Because most of the guests that come to our retreat 
are in this classification, they're either wanting to lose weight or they're diabetic or they have the abuse problem or a much smaller percentage are conquering cancer. So they all do much better with uh, the, the low, low sweet. And so that's what. And I'm mindful of our cooks that they're not having to cook different meals for different guests. So we, we basically do what everyone can eat. So if we do do a dessert, and we usually do a dessert once a week, and we'll often do a frozen cheesecake, and you ladies who are cooks, maybe some of the men are cooks, I'm just used to my husband who can cook toast, that's it, that um, you can Google frozen cheesecakes and there are some delicious desserts. They're very, very rich. They use a lot of nuts and ground up, some coconut oil to make it solid melt in your mouth and maybe some uh, uh, maple syrup. So they're, they're delicious. So when we, and it's nice to show the guests that there are some delicious desserts that you can make, but we just give our guests a little bit. Mm. So it's just like a little, something little and tasty at the end of the meal. Now, if we have someone who is with us who's on a cancer conquering diet, and they're watching, I'll give them maybe, you know, about eight cashews, that's their little dessert. But I usually warn them beforehand and say, look, we're going to have a dessert today, Are you okay with that? And do you understand why it is best that you don't have it? And, and I say, are you happy for me to give you some cashews? Oh yeah, so you, you know, you, you forewarn them. Yeah. And one lady, she said, can I just have half a mouthful? So of course, you know, she <laughs> have half a mouthful. That's not going to do a huge amount. She was very happy with half a mouthful. <laughs> so you, you, you're, um, you're working with, with the person. So I know in America and I know in Australia they have um, hydrangea plants. You're familiar with a hydrangea plant? It's like a, it's a big bush and it has big flowers on it. And each flower is made out of a whole lot of little flowers. That's a very popular shrub. And sometimes the hydrangea flowers are deep purple. Sometimes they're blue. Sometimes they're magenta pink. Sometimes they're paler pink. And it's not different types of hydrangea plants. What the gardener does, it plays, he plays with the soil. Different pH ding, bring up different colored flowers. So just as the gardener plays with the pH of the soil to bring up different colours, you and your guests can play with the pH of your soil, I mean cell, to, to produce different, different uh, responses in the body. Yeah? Sorry, what is with coconut milk? Coconut, uh, your coconut meat sits about here, sits about there. And you've got two different types of coconut milk. You've got the immature coconut, and the immature coconut is the green coconut, and the lining is like a thin white jelly, and all the nutrients are in the, in the fluid. And traditionally in Fiji, if a mother could not feed her baby, she would give her baby the coconut water. Can you buy coconut water here? I know in Australia you can buy coconut water. Well, that's not from the aged coconut. That's from the immature coconut. And a lady told me in Fiji, she said, my girlfriend was born 45 years ago. She was born on a little island in Fiji, a little remote island, and her mother died in childbirth and there were no women on the island. And so the men fed that newborn baby the immature coconut juice. And that baby thrived. And my friend who's a doctor in Fiji, her name's Lawata Mazandoli, she, she gets all her mothers that need to supplement or you know can't feed their baby to give them the green coconut milk. And apparently in the war, in those islands, if someone needed a blood transfusion, they would transfuse, because it's sterile, with the green coconut juice because it's incredibly high in nutrients. So we have a big difference between the aged coconut. Mm -hmm. So the aged coconut, the shell is brown like wood, mm -hmm. 
and when you open it, the, there's a thick, hard white mm. lining. And that's what the coconut milk and the coconut cream you buy is made out of that thick, hard white lining. So when I used to go to Fiji, they would make their own coconut milk and coconut cream by opening it and grating it and putting it with water and squeezing it and what comes out of this white milk. And then that fibre they just throw to the pigs or the chooks as food because everything's in that milk now. <clears throat> so the coconut milk, so you've got coconut water from the green coconut and you've got coconut milk and coconut cream. Coconut milk really is just coconut cream with a bit of extra water in it. Mm. And that makes a very nice uh, additive to curries. Mm. Some people like to put it on their breakfast instead of um, soy milk or, a, or an almond milk. Yes? What does the coconut water have? Nutrients? I have drunk it a number of times. Yeah, it's very high in minerals, incredibly high in minerals. So for them to transfuse people with it, it sounds like it's got about as many minerals as seawater. But obviously there'd be a little carbohydrate in there for them, for it to be slightly sweet. Yeah? We talked about babies before, and for babies who couldn't be breastfed for some reason, so coconut milk would be yeah, quite... Yeah, the, quite the coconut good. water. Yes. And we think it was very sad in Fiji a little while ago, the Fijian government told the, told the baby formula companies but they could not put Fijian baby on the, on the labels because there were doctors that were, were protesting you know, about these milk formulas coming into Fiji. And so as a response, the milk formula companies stopped sending their milk in. And there are a whole lot of mothers that are in an uproar because what are they going to feed their babies? I said to my friend, quick, write an article in the newspaper and feed your babies what you fed your babies a hundred years ago, which is the, the coconut water. <laughs>